Hello, this is Michael Tabb. This is uh, the class of November, even though it starts at the end of October. This is the November session of cre uh, character creation and development, as well as writing for film and animation, which is another word for screenwriting. Um, we are covering these two classes and the subject matters. I will ask everybody, if they do not mind, to mute their themselves when they are not wishing to speak so that we don't get too much background noise or looping sound, which is when my voice goes through the speakers and then comes out your side and comes back into your side and it creates a permanent loop and then we have to shut everything down, which is no fun. So, but anytime you want to speak, unmute yourself, ask a question. Uh, that's what we're here for. We're here to ask and answer questions. All right. So thank you all for coming. Um, and let's get started. Who has questions? Does anybody have a question to start us off? Remember to unmute yourself. I see someone has unmuted themselves. Okay, Professor Tab, I have a question about um, the PG-13 rating. Oh, and interesting. It's okay. Yeah, uh, from what I read, everything has to be PG-13. And I, I was wondering if there was any gray area or leeway with that? Here's the issue. Um, students come from all backgrounds and walks of life, and there are people who are very religious. There are people who scare easily and are uncomfortable reading horrific details of, of things. So we have to be considerate of those people. Um, I am not supposed to permit students to write R-rated material in the class, which means very minimal cursing and um, uh, no excessive blood or violence or um, gratuitous, you know what I mean. <laughs> uh, absolutely, absolutely, Professor Tab. But if I feel like um, my writing is sort of on the line, should I send it to you in advance or how it, does that work? Just keep it close and when you post it, because I can't review everything before it posts, when you post it, put a warning on the post in all caps saying, this this script may contain violent situations um, uh, that if you do not like violence, you may wish to read something else. Just okay. post that with your script and okay. let people know that it's either violence or um, or explicit uh, sexual nature, whatever it is. Uh, um, if it's erotica, you know, we don't do erotica in this. <laughs> In this uh, in this institution, not that there's not a wonderful market for it out there, but it's not what we do. Absolutely. Okay. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, sir. Excellent. One down. <laughs> All right. Do you have another question, or does anybody else have a question? Please feel free. Everybody, chime in. That's what this is for. And yes, Mr. Hamilton. Yes. Yeah, so. Um, this goes into uh, our assignment for this week that um, the premise, um, do we do we kind of keep it in the same kind of structure and format from last time, even though it may have changed, or do we add do we add something to that? Right. You, you keep um, the story? premise the same unless you have changed the premise based on. Uh, the growth of the story. In other words, if the premise is always in that, has all those same rules. We don't do a negative okay. phrased premise because we're trying to say what something is, not what it's not. We do not do um, cliches because everybody's going, because you're not going to make a name for yourself in the business if you've got nothing new to say. Um, right. you know, things like that. All the rules apply. Keep it to one sentence. Um, but if, if, your premise has evolved or you've found better wording for it, use whatever wording that you're using so that I can make sure that it works um, and, and give you feedback if there's something wrong with it particularly. So, so um, it's okay if it ch changes or grows, or but I would look at my feedback. I will try to get everybody feedback before the weekend 
Uh, I try to get feedback to everybody by Friday, but I have over 40 students this month. And basically, when you have 40 students, you're actually going over and doing 40 people's homework over again for everything they miss because you're trying to give examples on how to fix it and all that stuff. And you're trying to get in the headspace of the writer and try. It's a lot. So I would. It's a lot. <laughs> yeah. So I will try to get – but I try to get everything to everybody on Friday so that by Sunday they can look at my notes and see if they did get something wrong. They can fix it before the Sunday submission. Okay. Thank you. I don't envy you of the task. <laughs> don't. <laughs> Some months it's a little easier. Sometimes I only have like 25 students and that's very uh, manageable and I'll still have time when I have 25 students to work on my own scripts. I'm writing a, a, a movie right now. and. Um, but when I have uh, 40, it becomes a little harder to uh, work on my own things. But it's worth it because I, the way I see it is I'm writing. If I can help 40 great stories get made, it definitely trumps me doing one. And I'm creating a better environment for storytelling. So and creating a better situation for writers and, and better. I, I love what I do and I wouldn't trade it for anything. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Give you a minute to unmute. Ask anything you like. I'm sorry my phone buzzed. I get a lot of texts from people. Okay. So if there's nothing else, I'm going to start talking about the homework for this week. This week, in character creation and development, you are putting together two character dossiers in one document. Uh, you're going to start by taking what you've developed as a premise, the thing you want to say, and the most important thing you're going to do this week is build a proper inner and outer journey and antagonist's mission around what that premise was. So you're going to have a protagonist whose inner journey is going to prove the premise. You're going to have an outer journey that is a complete, completely physical goal in the real tangible world that we can see happen because we're writing for visual mediums like film and television and video games and, and um, comic books. So if you're writing, we're writing, we're all writing for, for video, visual mediums. So we want a visual comprehensible goal. It's not like a book where it's all really about something internally happening happening. That's what's going on under the surface. That's the subtext of our movie. That's the inner journey. So the inner journey is going to prove the premise. And then the outer journey is the physical visual medium, the not medium, uh, task that puts the character in the situation that requires them to have that internal change. And then, of course, you have an antagonist who is going against that protagonist's outer journey. So they're physically trying to accomplish something that if they accomplish it, the protagonist cannot achieve his or her outer journey. So though they may not have anything to do with each other personally, and as a matter of fact, their goals shouldn't have to do with each other. Uh, each person's goals is to achieve a specific goal. It's to do something. It's to get something done. But like if each one wants to win a certain trophy, then the other one has to lose. Right? If you want to be first place, there's only one first place. He doesn't care how many other people he has to beat to get first place, and whether the protagonist is one of them doesn't matter to the antagonist. The, kid, the antagonist wants to win, as does the protagonist, and just beating the antagonist is part of what that has to happen in order for them to achieve their goals. That's how you make a character feel realistic, is that they have a goal regardless of what other people are doing and how they're trying to do it. Um, so that's going to be the most important part, what I'm going to grade you the hardest on, because that's the core of your character. And then there's a, a bunch of questions in the dossier about each of those two characters that you can use to motivate those inner and outer journeys and explain why they are the way they are, what, why they're going after what they're going after, who they are, what they look like. Picture them in your head um, and give yourself some background as to the characters and their backstory so that when you go to write them, um, you understand the psychology and what it is they're doing and why, so that it makes total sense. Uh, that's really important. All right. So does anybody have any questions on the dossiers? I must be doing a fantastic job. Okay. Then 
let's talk about, I don't know how many of you are here from uh, writing for film and animation, but in that class, we are uh, going to the next stage of development. We have created all of our characters, all of our major characters. We know our premise. We have our log line for our story, what it is the story is we're trying to tell. Um, and now we're going to outline it. We are basically um, like a tent. A tent requires tent poles to hold it up in certain places. And we are designing the tent poles of story, the, the three-act structure. So again, I will try to get you your uh, feedback by Friday so that you can check it over the weekend and make sure that all of your characters are done correctly so that the three-act structure does line up on Sunday. The reason why I try to get everything back to you on Sundays, I mean on Fridays, by midnight is because that's also when you're getting the feedback from each other. So you get to go through everybody else's feedback at the same time you go through mine when you're planning on going through feedback to decide if anything needs to change in your base material. Um, also, when you turn in your three-act structure this week, you also have to turn in your revised uh, work from week one. So if any changes are required from, from your submission that I give you notes on by Friday, hopefully by Friday, uh, then you need to make those changes and fix those before you um, go back and finalize your structure that you turn in on Sunday. Um, does that uh, make perfect sense? Does anybody have any questions regarding that assignment? This may be the easiest go-to session I've ever had in the history of this department. <laughs> All right. Um, we may end this session in one minute if nobody has any questions about anything. I'm here at your disposal. If you have any questions, now is the time. I'm here for you. <laughs> I, I do. I do. Great. Um, More, please. This is Jackie, by the way. I This is Hi, all really... <laughs> this is all really new to me. I'm, you know, I'm a writer, but I'm used to the novel and the story, sure. and it. I'm trying to wrap my head around how can I get into a character to create another person that's separate from me. Well, I always think that there's a little piece of us in everybody we write: the good guys, the bad guys, and everything. And the key is the reason why I start with characters and motivations and character arcs is because. <laughs> You can design it through what are they trying to accomplish? And then you ask yeah. yourself, why would they want to accomplish this? Why would they want to accomplish this? What in their okay. life led them to want to do this thing? So it's important okay. to figure out what the characters are doing first so that you can figure out. That allows you to go through and try to figure out where, where do they come from that they would want this? And why do they want this? And what is it in their youth that made them feel this way? Why, if the person is heroic, why are they heroic? What happened to them in their youth? Did a fire take hold of the town and kill people that they cared about? Did, did um, Was somebody abused? And um, were the, was the family separated and there was a divorce? And so, okay. uh, you know, uh, okay. figure out when you, when you give people things they want to get accomplished, what you're really doing is laying the foundation for background work on a character to figure out why why okay okay always figure out why where and when when did it happen okay why are they doing this and, okay and where where why and when and why why okay. why 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 <laughs> <laughs> okay I mean, i've done that for stories and i have you know characters in my stories that i have in my head the backstory for but it's trying to visualize it that is a challenge but i'll do it and another one to ask yourself is how. How would how? this character do it? That might separate, help you separate yourself from them because you might okay. do things in a safe way, but don't forget that the most interesting characters are bold. Writers tend to be very safe people. We like to do our work where we be <laughs> wallflowers, we, we in our little computers, you know. Oh, very I true. You know, safe true. everybody else's prying eyes. Uh, but what's interesting to an audience are bold characters who are who are not afraid to risk and take chances and are willing to do that kind of thing. So okay. ask yourself how this character would do it. You know, okay. and how can stem from where they come from and why they're doing it. 
Like if somebody is trying to fight some, uh, trying to uh, get back uh, a kidnapped child, they are go how they're going to do it is differently if they're trained in the law and that's where they come from and what they come from than if it's their own child and they know nothing about the law. And, you know, Taken is a guy who worked with the military and did CIA missions or whatever, and he had a certain set of skills. That's how he would do it. Ask yourself right. who this character is, and then when you realize who they are, how would they do it? Okay, okay, I I think I got. It. I I can I can do it. It's just going. I know be, you can. It's just going to be really interesting. But thank you. I'm even picking your brain, but that's good. That's what I'm here for. Pick okay. away. Thank you. Thank you. You bet. you bet. Okay, we have a text question here. One thing I've done is I treat my characters like an alter ego. If I was this character. Who would, how would I, uh, who would I act? I, I believe she means how would I act? Um, what would I do? I try to act like this character is my alter ego, and that helps me get into the mindset to write from it. Thank you for the advice. Okay, that's good also. Um, does anybody else have any other questions? John, you have your, uh, your, your uh, mic open. Yes, thank you, Professor uh, Tab. So, um... I don't know if this will help Jack, Jacqueline, but um, and you can kind of check me on this. What I what I did was I went to my visuals and just to get the story, um, I went through my visuals and figured out, OK, what kind of stories are they telling? So, for example, is it about kidnapping? Is it about terrorism or a spy network or political corruption? corruption, that kind of thing. So then I use that as kind of the backdrop story to kind of build the scenario and try to figure out who the pr protagonists and the antagonists are and then build a, um, their wants and needs and goals and all that out of that particular situation. Is that does that sound kind of uh, culture? Absolutely. Another thing I want to mention is in week one, I had you all do a brainstorm uh, of visuals for uh, your genre. You should be looking for through that list and constantly expanding it. I mean, I shouldn't have to tell you, but that list should be hundreds of things long by the time you get right. Hundreds of th images long. And you can grab out of that ideas for what characters are doing for work and their jobs and where they do it and what happens and all the different things that happen in genre. Genre sets up certain expectations from our audience, and we want to make sure that we are giving them what they want when they go to see a movie in the genre that you're going to write. So a lot of times I do use the brainstorm to actually develop characters. Um, and that's a great way to do it as well. So go back and look at the brainstorm list and continue to expand on it because by the time you get to my next class, you have to have well over 100 images uh, before we start going even to the outline phase. Right. So that's what I chose. Uh, I went through my list of 40 visuals and, and, and um, out of those picked out uh, the particular story uh, parameters. Cool. As it should be. Um, great. Uh, does anybody else have any questions or thoughts they wish to share? Uh, yes, Professor Tab, I have one more question. Yes, Mr. Nichols. Um, I found it interesting that from what I read yesterday, the inner journey or the inner arc has to be accomplished before the outer journey is accomplished. Right. I never gave that much thought before I read that yesterday, but it's absolutely true. Yeah. Otherwise, they couldn't accomplish it. If you don't have to change to accomplish what you want to accomplish, you don't change at all. I will, you, change is so hard for us as people. We get so trapped in our, our ways of doing things. So only if to accomplish something important do we actually have to change. And if we don't have to change to accomplish something, like – you, you have to change the way you eat if you're going to be in great shape. You have to do it. And you can't change after you got into great shape because that's not going to work. <laughs> you know, you don't change. The change makes things get done. And that's what you change in order to get something done. Otherwise, you wouldn't go through the, the terrible hardship of what change requires of us. I guess I have a follow-up question to that. Can there be an outer journey without an inner journey? Like, if you have a perfect character, can there be some sort of like... First of all, no character should be perfect. That's my personal opinion. 
Absolutely. Secondly, um, what they do a lot of time in action movies, a lot of people don't realize this, is that the protagonist is not the central character of the film. So the protagonist doesn't have a the, – the central character of the film does not have a character arc. Marty McFly does not change in Back to the Future. He is on a mission to – he goes back in time and he has to get back to the present and stop Doc Brown from getting killed. Uh, but when he goes back in time, he thwarts his father from meeting his mother and so they don't fall in love, which means he's never going to be born unless he fix that relationship. But he can't fix that relationship because his dad is a total wimp and has no guts whatsoever. And it was sheer luck that they met the way that they did. And so what winds up happening is the action hero winds up being the mentor. The central character winds up being the mentor. And the protagonist is actually a supporting character. Which would be George McFly? That's right. Yes. George McFly has an enormous character arc. And it's only because George changes that the protagonist, that the, the central character can actually achieve his goal. So still, protagonist has to change, and then the, protag and then the central character can succeed. Okay. Which is why the, at the end, the, the whole um, house has changed. And, yeah. And the, right, exactly. Because he stood up to Biff. Right. And, and Biff is waxing the horn. Waxing his car. And he's now a published author with stories that he wrote but never believed anybody would like. So I guess the uh, next, or the, um, the part that we miss is Biff also has an arc too, <laughs> in a sense. A reverse arc, absolutely. He right. tumbled. He is, because he's all ego. And at the end of the movie, he's humble. He has a, he has a counter arc. It's interesting. Does that answer your question about the inner journey? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, and how some characters seem, sometimes a central character seems not to have a character arc, and that's because they're really doing the role of a mentor. That happens a lot in military films, where you have a guy who's the commanding officer of a, of a set of troops, and then the, uh, the troops are actually the ones who go through changes and have to follow, and like, um, like Upham is the character with the arc, while Miller is the character who's the mentor and the central character in a Saving Private Ryan. Hanks, Hanks's character does not have a character arc. He is a mentor, and Upham is the one who has to learn to shoot the German, and that sometimes in war you can't have mercy, because it'll just kill everybody who you care about. Yes, sir. I was thinking more Sergeant Hoka from... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Our big toe. But, yeah, big toe, right. <laughs> very good, very good. Yeah, so I did have a kind of to see how far he can stick his big toe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. All right, fella. That's the drill sergeant. Yes, all right, yeah. fella. You. <laughs> <laughs> yeah right. <laughs> you, <laughs> that's you, oh, that's what, our big best bestest friend. <laughs> well, I, I I love Bill Murray in anything. He's just one of my favorites. He he can't not laugh. Right, exactly, exactly. Okay. So um, so according to the inner and outer outer um journey. Yeah. So do do they have to be somewhat associated? Or is that better or? It should be because it, it's the outer journey that inspires the inner journey to happen. The, it should be, you should try to find an outer journey that is very, like if the, if the movie is about finding your courage, you know, the outer journey you might have to do with standing up to a bully or um, right. Right. something okay. like that. Um, you know, if, if it's, a lack of confidence, then it would be to achieve a job or something that, you know, he's never tried for promotion or whatever. Um, it, they, they, they should be direct. Everything, everything is directly linked, by the way, in the whole story process. Everything, it's like two sides of a hook. It's like those monkeys, you know, the, the, the barrel of monkeys, 
right. yes. onto something so that it all fits together like a cohesive whole. And everything comes together like this, like puzzle pieces. So, so if one monkey is missing, basically the, the whole the, monkey chain breaks? The whole, the, the mission, it can't. It depends on how gaping that hole is and how obvious it is. Um, and, and there will be, there could be a hole in your plot. But, you know, sometimes a character doesn't need certain things. Like, for example, uh, in some stories, you, you need a protagonist and an antagonist, an antagonistic force. Those are the things you need. A premise is, is, is designed to, to be what's proven by the protagonist. So those things are linked. The antagonist tries to, pre presents really the counter argument to your premise by fighting your protagonist in a different way. And then you have other characters, which we'll learn about in week three of uh, character creation class, the mentor, the, uh, the ally slash reflection character, and the love interest. And okay. they are all tied to the protagonist's journeys as well. Everybody's anchored together because the romantic interest is there to help the protagonist along their inner journey. Well, you have a mentor who's there to teach them how to achieve the outer journey. And then they have allies and reflection characters who surround them and either are of support or against that, that, that outer journey. Uh, all okay. of them, they're trying to achieve it. Now, um, that brings up an interesting question. Mm -hmm. Should the antagonist be as layered as their protagonist to sort of like level Why them not? off? Why wouldn't they be? I, everybody loves a great layered antagonist. I mean, there's only so much you can get into usually because you're following the protagonist's journey um, or the mentor's journey when that's the central. You're following the central character's journey. So whoever the central character is, you're going to only have so much time to spend with other characters unless you're making an ensemble film, uh, a more ensemble film. But, um, yeah, every character – I like to have all – who, who's going to say, no, I like my character paper thin with no depth. Uh, that's, <laughs> we want, we want to give everybody um, a soul. We want to give them, you know, what make, what makes really compelling drama is when the antagonist, it, we totally understand where they're coming from and they make us almost care. It's like uh, in a movie that's a simple sci-fi movie, like um, Star Trek to the Wrath of Khan. Khan got stranded on a planet uh, for 50 years or whatever, and his, his, the woman he loved died, mm. and his people have lost everything and lived in a totally inhospitable land with, with no resources, and he wants revenge. Well, if somebody had hurt our family and stranded us on an island or uh, a planet, that was desolate and left us there for 50 years and never checked in, knowing that they were a remote civilization and stranded them there, you can totally understand why he wants to get back at Kirk. Makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense. And there's a lot of depth there. I mean, come on. That, that's, I mean, the greatest antagonists are doing what they're doing because they have experienced real pain. And they're trying to make real change. And they're trying to see some kind of justice done. Whether we agreed with their methods, you know, may not be, but, but it's interesting. It's human. These characters are all human. And that's what makes them great. Yes. Um, I read somewhere that a good character has a mixture of emotions, both positive and negative. And that they come across as being real people. I'm, I'm sure it's kind of cliche, but um, mm -hmm. yeah, they have depth. Characters should all have depth. And now in the f final, and that's what's going to make actors want to play them. How do you get actors to play small parts? Is you make them extremely memorable by making them innately, deeply human, deeply flawed, deeply uh, involved with something that means something to them. Something that somebody reading it could understand and make them want to play that part. The better you Absolutely. play the role, the better actors you're going to get to play the role. And believe me, we want great actors for all our parts. Yes. Famous or not, doesn't matter. There are a lot of great artists in L.A. 
a lot of great actors. A lot of them not known. A lot of them haven't gotten their break. So, so right, was Los Angeles? Right, so, I'm sorry. One more time. No, go ahead. Is Los Angeles the only hub? Maybe New York City for great actors, or no? Like I'm living. I think there could be great actors anywhere. To be honest, um, I just think that the industry centers in in Hollywood, um, and uh, it's important. I mean, yes, absolutely. Austin, Texas has one. Atlanta, Georgia has one. Um, uh, you know, they have places, but uh, and they do local hires uh, for things that shoot in different places. All the major cities, you know, you know, and there's even um, people who cast things out of Virginia or whatever, you know, uh, all over. They're, they're, they're casting agencies in Florida because they shoot in Florida. You know, it's actors can be anywhere and they can be very talented. But Hollywood is just it's the hub of the industry. It's it's. Uh, it's the core of where everything stems from. It's in everything that is television. Most of those shows have writers' rooms in Hollywood. That's where people write from. I mean, obviously they do some in Canada. They have some Canadian writers, obviously, and you know some of the soaps and stuff used to shoot in New York. I'm sure they still do. Um, there, some companies may be elsewhere, but Hollywood is the, is where all the studio lots are. You know, all the big ones. You know, 20th Century Fox, Sony. Warner Brothers, Universal Studios, they're all in Hollywood, Paramount Pictures, uh, all the all their big lots are in Hollywood or in the surrounding area of Los Angeles. So that, and because those where the big offices are and where the big sound stages are and where things happen, that tends to be um, the mecca of, of filmmaking. Uh, even though they may shoot the film somewhere else for tax purposes or whatever. Yes, sir. Any other questions, anybody? Hey, how's it going? I have a question for you. Yes, Mr. Turnpaw. Um, basically, the way it is in filmmaking, they say that um, you need to live in L.A. Uh, if you're doing film for the most part. But with writing, say, hypothetically, one of us writes something that gets sold. Sure. Would it be, would it be better to live there? Or to live wherever. I mean, are they going to fly you out? Or, um, okay. So, obviously, different mediums do different things. Like, for example, if you work in video games, a lot of the video game writers are actually in San Francisco in Silicon Valley, where all that technology is developed. Uh, other other times, people do it right remotely. Um, but uh, for the for film, is different from te television. Is mainly LA. Film, though, if you're talking about screenplay, single story, two hour format. Um, the truth is, you can write a first drafts of things from anywhere in the world. I recommend you, but if you want to meet people who are going to be able to help you and make alliances and friendships and build a group of people who, who can help you succeed, the, there, you'd be kidding yourself if you think you're going to find any place like LA to do that. Um, you may be able to get in in another way, like winning a bunch of competitions with your script and submitting that way and hoping that garners some attention. But before you go there, I would recommend that you, you have at least three completed really rock-solid scripts in your pocket before you go. Don't just say, I'm going to be a writer, so I'm going to go there, because that's a huge change, and you have to be ready to, to starve and to take – Really, if you want to work in the industry while you're working your way up and make, writing your scripts, then you're going to get really low-paying jobs um, because everybody wants to be in the movie business out there. You know, They don't pay great. They expect unbelievable hours and dedication. Um, it's, it's pretty tough being an assistant in those offices and all that stuff. But um, people love being surrounded by the business and the hustle and the, and the networking and the going to places and building their roster of contacts. But personally, if you have a good job where you are, and uh, I would keep a good job and develop the material ready to go out there before I go so that you can get out there and meet people instantly. It does you no good to be there, make contacts and say, I'm a writer. They go, well, what do you have? You, 
if you have nothing to show them, nothing that's really ready that you're really proud of, and you don't have a couple idea, a couple samples, writing samples that say it in actual feature length. Like in this program, you're going to write shorts. And when you're done with here, you're going to want to expand those into full lengths because we don't have time to write a short, a full length in, in four weeks, which is the length of our classes. So we write short form to get you ready. And then, and then uh, so you go there with finished product so that you can show it to people. Otherwise, they're going to say, what have you done? Or what, 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 what are you working on? And then you've got nothing to show them. Does right. that make sense? I yeah, it does. I'd rather not be in L.A., so that's, <laughs> that's why that's I was fine. curious. But then you don't have to. I mean, look, there's no rule saying you have to be in L.A. You can, you, you can submit to contests and make sure you do the big ones if you're going to do them, like the nickel, the, 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 maybe the blacklist or um, the heart of Austin, Texas, uh, uh, Toronto Film Festival, uh, Sundance and Slam Dance, you know, um, Final draft. Uh, there, there's a group of them. And when you get into the screenwriting class, um, as one of the extra assignments at the bottom of the class, I have a list of places you can apply for jobs in Hollywood and all the, the job websites for all those different studios so that you can look for a job there if you want to move there and just get started. And then I also have another one that lists the major screenwriting competitions and the ones you should apply for. Okay, cool. And well, thank you so you much. Have that as a resource. I put that together. My Thank pleasure. you. You bet. My pleasure. That's why I'm here. Uh, okay. Did I miss any questions? Do you have to be in LA in order to find TV writing job? Uh, Atlanta has has options. Um, absolutely. Uh, TV. Most TV is done in LA, and people want to take meetings and meet people they like. And uh, agents are you, you, you get an agent to get out your script out there, and then when the team, all the writing is done in a room together. I mean, well, not all of it. What happens is they hire so many writers for a show. To understand the math of a TV show writing staff, it's take the number of episodes that they're being contracted to write and average out that everybody does too. All right. So in a typical television season uh, on network television, you're looking at 22 to 24 episodes of television in, in primetime network. So that means they're going to ha have about 11 to 12 writers on staff. And how they work it is they come in for staff meetings, brainstorm stories and episode stories and character arcs and what's happening led by the person who is the showrunner of the show or the creator, sometimes the same person. And then, uh, once they figure out all the beats, the major beats of the show, they divvy up the shows and who's going to write what. And people go into their offices and then bring in pages when they have them ready. So you all have to be able to work in the same offices. And because the majority of the television work is in L.A., that it is a good idea to be there. But you can start in Atlanta, write a couple pilots, write a couple spec samples of other people's scripts that are still on air that show that you know how to mimic somebody's voice. And, uh, you know, do do three to four scripts. I would do two sample scripts of things that are already on air, things that are going to run, look like they will run for a long time. And then you do two uh, scripts that are original pilots that you want to get made that speak to who you are and the kind of stories you want to write. And then when you have four scripts ready, then think about moving. Until then, you can work where you are uh, and find things in Atlanta or whatever. You're very welcome. Uh, uh, I have a question. Yes, please. Um, I'm going to try to make this question make as much sense as possible. Uh, I was okay. trying to think of my premise and how I wanted it to work out. And there's a lot of movies, you know, I haven't written, I haven't seen, excuse me, not written, that I haven't seen of course, and I was wondering, is it possible to tell the story from the antagonist's point of view? Like a lot of times it's the protagonist working towards and then the antagonist is the one that is, you know, that they're working against. But what if the story is told from the antagonist's point of view? The antagonist is the central character. Um, is that character going to change? Are they going to realize anything? Are you trying to prove? They're going to realize they're 
bad and they want change? Yeah. I mean, Probably. But like a funny thing, like an American psycho, uh, uh, the protagonist actually wants to be caught. And he's disappointed at the end that the cops aren't up for the task. Something similar to even that. A, even a like, protagonist. Even a, well, have you ever seen American Psycho? No. It's a very violent movie. Knowing that, if you're dealing with serial killers and, and a murderer or whatever, mm-hmm. it, it, it's the, the wheelhouse you're talking about, I would check it out. Um, if you don't mind those kind of very violent movies. I wouldn't recommend that as to somebody who's very religious and doesn't like those kind of movies. <laughs> um, no, it's fine. I'm just... It's the same type of premise, like he, this person, you know, He's still has been getting team. away with so many crime and getting so much stuff that they want someone to meet the challenge of them, but I don't want to tell it from... The protagonist doesn't have to be a good guy, and that's something you have to realize. A lot of times a protagonist is a hero because of the old uh, hero, the, the hero's journey kind of made it so that everybody understood how a story was being told structurally from a hero's perspective, but not all protagonists are heroes. Sometimes they're awful, awful people uh, trying to do something awful to other people. Um, the key is that they have a character arc and that their antagonist can actually be a good guy. In movies like Falling Down and stuff, you have uh, a guy who's, who's on the way, he's on his way home from work to murder his wife and child. And there's a cop trying to stop him, figure out where he's going, why he's doing it, and what his goal is. And the cop, who's the good guy, is actually the antagonist from the perspective of the protagonist. Who realizes he's done wrong because he's lost his credit. The whole beginning is this guy realizes that this world is chaotic and awful and people are crap and there's no decency and and he's going to get home and he's caught in traffic, which is mind numbing and making it, he's just losing his freaking mind. And then he just decides to leave his car in the middle of Los Angeles freeway traffic and get out and walk home. And he and he kills people and hurts people because they're bad. Because uh, the world is awful and everybody in it. Yes, Michael Douglas rules in that flick. And he's a guy who snapped. He has snapped. He's not good. And what was so, the name of that, that one again? Falling Down. Okay. Okay, I'll look in. Uh, falling Down, films. American Psycho. Um, okay. You can also look at A Clockwork Orange, which is a classic by uh, Stanley Kubrick. Those are characters where the leading character is bad. The same thing is a really wonderful growing character um, in Nightcrawler, a more recent movie. Um, a guy who gets starts working in, in press and stories, and then he starts wanting to create the stories to get bigger stories. And he starts eventually doing horrible things. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. This is good. This is what we're supposed to do. This is the classroom feeling I'm trying to create. Anybody else have any other questions? I was curious. I was just thinking about something. Sure. Who do you who do you think would be the protagonist in like the 78 Halloween movie? Because I'm like, is it Loomis? Is it Laurie Strode? <laughs> I was having a hard time trying to figure out who the actual protagonist was. I have to go back and watch it uh, to see it from that. Who's the one who changes the most? Well, she's running the whole time scared. In the end, she stands up to Michael, right? Yeah. Yeah. She's Kind of. Kind of. <laughs> it's, if the central character, the central character, more than one character can have a character arc. So the protagonist is the character with the most significant space in the film that is also a character arc. Okay, that makes sense. Yes. And then, Thanks. like a lot of times, reflection characters um, or allies also have character arcs. What you find out is the protagonist is the one who's our hero because of the fact 
in the, in the story because they have the courage to go through the change to do what needs to be done at the end of the movie, not the others. And then after seeing the protagonist make that change and do those things at the end, other people come around and start to change and follow their lead. Okay. So a protagonist can be the first of many characters to have character arcs. And a lot of times the protagonist inspires the other character arcs that occur around them. That's why they're the lead okay. of the story. Okay. That makes perfect sense. Thank you. You bet. Anyone else? I once sat on one of these calls with students for five and a half hours. I will not leave until I've answered every question. But if we have no more questions, then we can all go back to our daily lives. <laughs> and I can go back to grading. <laughs> Does anybody else have any questions? I don't want to leave anybody hanging. Going once. Ah, good. Mr. Nichols. Yes, Professor Tapp. Um, do screenwriters ever become successful outside of big Hollywood or um, the big studios? Like if they say, I just want to do whatever I want, and so they make their own Woody independent Allen. films. Woody Allen is probably one of the biggest screenwriters in the world. He never left New York. He doesn't, he doesn't come and move to L.A. He does independent character films. You know, yes, uh, uh, Quentin Tarantino went to L.A., but, you know, uh, and he made his success and he wound up being in L.A., but, you know, his films aren't traditional Hollywood fare. He has his own voice. You can be a visionary, and as long as you're providing a need. Um, like what about George Lucas? George Lucas is a Hollywood storyteller. Uh, he did, first did American Graffiti and um, it was an ensemble coming of age film about all the kids on their last night of uh, school before they all go off to their lives after high school. You know, some go, are, are they going to go to college? Are they going to do this? Are they going to just stay here and never change? Um, you know, and there's a, there's, you know, the old soda diner where they all hang out and it's, you know, like the movie diner, you know, some things are ensemble character pieces that are smaller, but that doesn't make them not Hollywood. Um, and then he turned around and made the biggest science fiction epic of all time, <laughs> which was, there's some great stories around that. Um, but the, he did that for 20th Century Fox. He did Star Wars for 20th Century Fox. So I, I feel like what makes, the question you're asking is, do you have to write big films? Because really, if you write big films, that's where the money is to make them. Now, those are the, the built-in uh, houses, the production companies, the studios, and the networks. Those are the financiers for these kind of movies that are big. And unless you know a really big independent financier who just wants to make a movie, like Fred Smith start, uh, financed Alcon for the first number of years because he wanted to make movies. He owns FedEx. You know, uh, Branson, uh, Richard Branson started Virgin uh, 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 he owns Virgin, you know, with airlines and, and all the other, and used to have record stores and, uh, and uh, uh, music stores or whatever, Virgin Atlantic. And he, um, uh, Virgin Atlantic is different, but anyway, and then he got into movies and started doing that. But then when they opened their shops and their production companies, they opened them in Hollywood because that's where you have access to make things um, to the people who do make things. It's not the only place, but it's the central hub. You know, do you want to be in the hub? If you don't want to be in the hub, then don't be in the hub. But if you don't want to need Hollywood, then you're going to want to write stories that um, are more affordable to make. Chances are. So, so basically, I, for, if I understand what you're saying, the money might not be there for these other films, but the audience will be? I'm not saying um, it will be. Uh, I can't tell the story. Yeah. Uh, no, you know, uh, well over 50% of films do never make back their money at all. Uh, wow. And, and, you know, but there are a lot of, lot of movies that I'm talking about a lot of independent movies. There are a lot of movies, the majority of movies made outside of the studio system, the majority of them never get a release. Into a theater? That's right. Sometimes they never even get onto Netflix or something like that. The majority of films that get made don't come out well, that are made by people that are not run by studios who check and balance everything to make sure everybody's competent on a production. Wow, that's and rather that's, troubling. It, it, it is. It is. But you know what? 
sometimes making a film is about the process and telling your story and learning how to tell a story better and doing it independently is fine. I mean, let's look at uh, Sex, Lies, and Videotape made by Steven Soderbergh. He became very successful, did all those Oceans 11, 12, and 13 movies, right? Um, yes, very big stuff. But he started with a little movie, you know, just like um, Edward, uh, uh, what's his name, from NYU, who went out and made his own film, The Brothers McMullen. You know, basically about his own family life growing up in New York. And then it got some success. You know, um, Spike Lee out of NYU did a, 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 a basketball movie and she's got to have it. You know, and they, these, weren't, these weren't made by the big studio system. They went out with cameras provided by film schools and went and decided to make, scrimped and saved and charged up their credit cards and made films. And they had... A, a, strong enough vision that the studios came calling once they saw it, once they won some film festivals. So basically these um, directors yeah. made oh, enough waves? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah? They made enough waves for themselves that the, the Hollywood system came to them? Yes. As a, yeah. Yes, but you have to make sure that you're really striking a chord in the American culture, whether it's pop culture or whatever. You, you really have to hit a chord with what you're saying. So it's not just a story about, you know, something we've seen before. You have, that's why premise is so important because you're saying something totally unique we haven't seen before. And nine times out of ten, what needs to be said and seen from this premise happens to do with what's going on in the world today because that's what makes us come up with the opinion. And because it's today, that's why it hasn't been done before. The, thing, the things that have been done before have been things that we've seen, uh, things that fitted the, fit the culture that happened before us. Okay. That happens for music bands? Absolutely. Yeah, Kevin Smith was a visionary too with Clerks. I, it, it was literally, he hit on a chord that was going on in our country and what was going on with young people and, you know, the feckless existence of working at a gas station in the middle of nowhere <laughs> and great characters. And, you know, you know, he had Jay and Silent Bob in that movie, the little guys, the guys that hung out on so outside, you know, those characters who, who had meaning and depth and were funny as hell. And, you know, they were just as unique as the guys who worked inside the shop, you know, made great characters. And it, it felt like it really encapsulated a time and space. Uh, absolutely. Uh, Rodriguez uh, did El Mariachi uh, before he did Desperado. Um, so you can definitely, but just make sure you, you make something in a way that, that, you know, it doesn't require a studio to get it made. You know, that's important if you want to make it for yourself. Yes, sir. You don't need huge explosions in order to, to get people's attention. You need huge characters. All right. Do we have any other questions? Going once. Going twice. All right. Thank you all for coming. It's a pleasure to have spent some time with all of you. We'll do this again next week.